All right, welcome to the first episode from the Man Cave. I am Pete Spratt, and my co-host is Brian Wynn. I call him B-Winning <laughs> because the of the Asian B-win. flavor. <laughs> All right, some of the stuff we're going to talk about today. Uh, first off, we're going to get into uh, the, uh, the last UFC we had, UFC 198. Uh, uh, but before that, let me jump into and give a uh, give a RIP to uh, to Jordan Parsons, uh, one of the guys lost uh, from my MMA family. Uh, he was uh, hit via hit and run by some guy that just didn't even have the audacity to to stop and show concern for a fellow human being. And uh, Jordan ended up later on losing his life to that accident. And uh, I just want to send a heartfelt uh, sorrow to his family and friends and everybody out there. Uh, I believe he was a member of the uh, Black Zillions team, maybe. So, uh, you know, I want to send my condolences to the Black Zillions and those guys. And, uh, you know, may Jordan rest in peace. It's a real tragedy. And, you know, we hate to see anything like that. And. It's just really eye-opening how any day, you never know, you could be walking down the street looking at your phone, next thing you know, you know, your life can be taken away. So uh, I want to just take a second to uh, appreciate my life and everyone else's and our health because you never know what can happen and get snatched away from you in an instant. It's true. All right, well, let's jump right into it. Let's talk about UFC 198 that took place last night. And, you know, there seems to be this big thing about, you know, them wanting Conor McGregor to be on UFC 200. He's the biggest star in the UFC right now, Ronda Rousey, blase, blase. But All last... star power, right? Yeah, yeah. And last night's um, UFC was the third largest crowd in UFC history, uh, upwards of 42,000 fans there. And... Uh, Within thirty within thirty minutes, no, ninety minutes, there were thirty two thousand tickets already sold for that particular event. So regardless of what people might think, there's always another star that's in line ready to come up. And uh the UFC's gonna roll on whether they have Conor McGregor and as you can see Ronda Rousey's been calm for quite some time and the machine is still rolling. So regardless of what everybody might think, the UFC doesn't need one individual fighter. Because if they did, Conor McGregor would still be on mm-hmm. UFC 200 anyway, exactly. and he's not. So, you know, you, UFC, you know, sometimes has to put their foot down. And with this instance, they put their foot down with, with Conor, even though he's their biggest moneymaker. But, you know, before they they did the same thing, they pulled uh, Nick Diaz from a card because he wouldn't do the press stuff. So, you know, it is what it is. You know, that's that's part of your contract. Pretty much the UFC owns you once you sign that contract. And you have to do what they want you to do regardless. I mean, the UFC's been around way before Conor McGregor. Yeah. And they're going to be around after him, let's be real. And it just, I think it goes to show, like we were saying earlier, that, you know, yeah, the stars are come and go, but let's be real, these the UFC is the star maker. Yeah, exactly. You know, and without that platform, without that forum, it's hard for these guys to get their name out. You know? Exactly. And I mean, congrats on him for being the first, you know, disclosed one million dollar paid fighter, uh, which is which is great. And hopefully it's gonna be great for, for other fighters coming up, but you know, it is what it is. You gotta abide by the rules and you know, mat- no matter your star power. They can find somebody else. Yeah, I mean, he ain't, Flay, he ain't Floyd Mayweather. He's, this is not McGregor Promotions. Mm-hmm. It's the UFC, so you got to do what you got to do. Uh, all right, now jumping into uh, UFC 198, I want to touch on, uh, first I want to touch on the Matt brown Damian Meyer fight. Uh, you know, I took particular interest in this fight because, you know, I fought Matt Brown before he got in the UFC, and uh, uh, this was a fight that I figured it was going to be a situation where Matt was going to have to keep this keep his distance and timing, uh, use his angles and keep it on the feet and just kind of pot shot Maya from, from a distance. And uh, it just seems like he, he couldn't impose uh, his game plan. Uh, he backed straight up a couple of times and, you know, once Damien got him into the clinch, it was pretty much his game from there. Matt was fighting off the rear naked choke for the majority of the fight. And uh, although, you know, the punches that... Uh, Maya was landing, was, there was no really effect, you know, you know, Matt was pretty much kind of bored with it, but 
I, I think he was hoping to look for a stand-up for the referee because he was kind of looking at the referee a few times when Maya was just kind of tapping him. And we've always been told that if a person has back position, has your back, you will not be stood up for any reason. It's kind of different from being in side control or pressing somebody against the fence and, and not being busy. Uh, back control is... is, so is dominant. Yeah, it's total domination. So there's no reason for the referee to stand you up. You have to work out work out of that position. And, uh, you know, eventually uh, Maya got sunk in the, the rear naked uh, toward the end of the third round to uh, to win the fight. But, you know, I just felt... I mean, I felt Matt's pain because I've been in that situation before. And uh, I felt his pain tremendously. But, you know, it is what it is. You got you got to work on being able to escape those positions yeah. and, you know, not get out of those positions. But had he used his footwork and angles and stuff like that, then he probably wouldn't have been in that position. In the first place. Yeah, 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 for sure. Right. But you can't expect a, the referee to come save you from yourself. You yeah, know? yeah. It, and, you know, I mean, we know going in, you know, pre-fight rules mean to say, if guy take you back, <laughs> I'm not. I'm not restarting it. You right. know, that's, that's complete and total dominated position. So he had a, quite a, a, a long day ahead of him with Damian Maya. Yeah, too. yeah. I mean, I think he could have made it easy on himself. You know, again with with angles and probably pot shotting him from the back because Damian uh, he had a couple of terrible shots that that Matt defended, but uh, at the end of the day, when Matt put his back up against the fence and Damian locked up on him, then. Matt couldn't get him off from that much, point. Right? Yeah, it was just just too much for being from a world class grappler mm -hmm. like uh, Damian Maya. Uh, next, uh, I want to go into the Nathan Marquardt and Tiago Santos. Uh, I didn't even see that when it was over so quick. Yeah, man. Uh, I think you know you know Nate's been in the game a long time, and I I just look at that as like one of the one of the up and coming new young kids mm -hmm. just just having a little bit more in the gas tank than than Nate cuz Nate is coming up on I want to say 16 17 18 years fighting uh and you know Tiago was just he was just uh more athletic uh looked bigger looked stronger looked a little bit faster and it was just you know kind of one of those things where Nate got caught and that was it lights out mm -hmm. you know uh Got overwhelmed by a talented upcomer. Yeah, up -comer. yeah. I mean, that guy, that guy's been, uh, he's been destroying people his last few fights, and you know, Nate's coming off a, a big win against CB Dalloway, knocking out CB Dalloway. But uh, yeah, I think that was just one of those, one of those situations where he, you know, caught a younger, faster, talented guy. Uh, now, probably the fight of the night, uh, which. You know, you you kind of mentioned that a lot of people was talking about it might be the fight of the year oh, yeah. was uh, Yancey Medeiros and uh, Francisco Trinaldo. Now, for me, that I mean, people, people love those brawls. You know? Yeah, people love the brawls, and well, really, people love a guy getting beat up and the and that guy that's getting beat up not quitting, mm -hmm. and that's the situation we had in this particular fight. Uh, Francisco was completely manhandling uh, Maderos, but you know at the same time, you know Maderos showed a lot of heart. Uh, he had he had some bright spots in the fight where he would come back and and catch uh, Francisco with a couple of different shots or move position or get a reversal or something like that. But you know at the end of the day, it was a it was a pretty dominant fight. I think two judges might have had it thirty to twenty six uh, for Trinado. And uh, I think the other judge had a 30-27. So you can mm -hmm. see the complete domination there on the sto on the scorecards. But uh, people it, just love watching that heart. Yeah, yeah, it was it was definitely a heartfelt performance for Maderos. But you know, at the end of the day, he just got he just got completely dominated, mm -hmm. except for certain spots in the fight. Uh, but he had he had no chance to win that fight, uh, in my opinion, at all. But again. Showed great heart, made for made for a great, exciting fight for the fans, and uh, I'm pretty sure they got some fight bonuses out of that. What about what about uh, the tattoo face guy punking uh, the one dude at the way in again? Here yeah, we that was uh, uh, on the uh, on the Bellator card, uh, Phil Ho oh, and Rygert. Uh, yeah, I, I, I caught it on the 
on the internet or Facebook somewhere where, uh, you know, Riker is just going all up in Phil Ho's face and, you know, Phil Ho's not backing down. And then, you know, to go into the fight and then get completely dominated and knocked out by the guy you were trying to punk at weigh-ins, that tells you that. Karma kind of goes a long way. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, for me, I've never done that. I've never had the desire to, to be all up in somebody's face or talk trash in, in somebody's face at the weigh-in because you never know how the, how the fight's going to turn out. And most of the time for those guys, man, they get beat up. I mean, Connor's done it for a long time, and he's been on the on the on the good side of that, and he's been destroying people and knocking out people, and you know, then he did that crap against a guy that typically does it to other people, <laughs> and then uh, Nate came in and put the hammer down on Connor, mm -hmm. and then Connor shut his mouth for a little while, but. You know, now he's back to talking. So, yeah, I got it. but let's be real. I mean, Conor McGregor is an exception to all these guys. I mean, most people don't get away with running their mouth and are able to back it up like he does. You know. Well, I mean, like Nate said, you know, when you're fighting a bunch of midgets, I guess you can do that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's not my words. That's, those are Nate's words. He's got a point. He you was know? he was much bigger than a bunch of those guys at what one. 35? No, 145. Yeah, 145. So, yeah, he, he was he was huge, man. I remember seeing him when uh, when I, me and Rodrigo cornered Diego uh, for his fight against yeah, him in I Ireland. Know. And we saw him at the open workouts. Probably, I think, I want to say it was maybe three days before the weigh-in. And I know McGregor. I think I heard somebody say he was weighing at 162 about three days before the fight. And so I was like, man, this dude is huge. And, uh, you know... A lot of people say sometimes the size doesn't matter, but you know, in this business, at some point, size does matter, especially when you got size, athleticism, uh, talent, timing, All speed. Equally. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a re they have weight classes for a reason. Right? Yeah, yeah. He definitely got all the, all the essentials, and uh, yeah, the guy he, he was on quite a tear. But anyway, so now we're gonna go into uh, we can either go into the heavyweight bout. Or we can go to. Uh, Let's talk about Cyborg and uh, exactly Cyborg's uh, little performance. Cyborg's display. debut, the long-awaited debut for Cyborg. We talking about Chris Cyborg, not Evangelista. Not her ex-husband. Yeah. Kind of got pieced uh, up. <laughs> hey, she. Uh, I mean, I want to say she didn't disappoint. I mean, I'm glad there was somebody that was willing to step up. Uh, what was her name? Uh, Leslie Smith. Leslie Smith. Tough yeah, young yeah. Lady. Very tough. You know, I saw during the pre-fight interview they're talking about her ear was halfway off in the fight, and she still continued to fight. You know, I'd have been like, "Hold up, <laughs> put my ear back on." She was upset when they stopped that fight. <laughs> bro. Know, her ears but, hanging off her head. But yeah, I mean, uh, Chris Cyborg didn't disappoint. I mean, she's been one of the most dominant females in the sport since she has been fighting. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, for Nothing the, but striking last night. Yeah, yeah, nothing but striking. Uh, her striking, and actually her boxing looked really, really sharp, really, really crisp last night. Powerful. And uh, yeah, I was, uh, her timing, her distance uh, was great last night. Her combinations were great. And, uh, you know, Leslie, I mean, she showed a lot of heart and she was complaining that she never stopped, but... Uh, Cyborg put that two piece on her, and that that fight was that fight was pretty much over unless you just wanted to just get beat up. I mean, you know, I get yeah. it that you're tough and all, but you know, better be better to take less damage than to have some long term effects from Cyborg putting it on you the way she did. But you know, again, you know, Cyborg didn't disappoint. Uh, hopefully, now with these these new uh, MMA fans that's been MMA fans since Ronda Rousey. Uh, has popped on the scene, realize what all the talk has been about from the true MMA fans about a matchup between Rousey and Cyborg. I mean, at the end of the day, it's st it would still be an interesting matchup, but I think people see that, that Cyborg is really a whole different animal. And, uh, you know, hopefully she'll be able to... Uh, Go to 135 pounds. Uh, I think so. She made 100. It looks like she made 139 pounds pretty easily. She and can make uh, 136. yeah, I mean, if it's not a title fight, 
Uh, I don't see a problem with her being able to drop three more pounds to be able to make the limit of 136. And I mean, and even if it is a title fight at 135, so, uh, you know, I think, I think there's, a, there's a bright future for Cyborg in the UFC once she decides to make that cut and go into that particular weight class. Uh, but it should be interesting, man. I'm interested to see. I don't know if she's going to defend her title at Invicta again or whatever the case may be, but, you know, it's going to be a situation of what, whatever, pretty much whatever the UFC wants her to do. And, uh, you know, she might have to vacate. Uh, well, I mean, she, she won't have to vacate, I guess, because it's two different titles. She has the 140. She's the 145 champion. Uh, so, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. I'm interested to see who our next matchup is going to be against, if it is indeed in the, uh, in the UFC, and will it be at 135 pounds since she obviously passed the, uh, the catch weight test cut mm -hmm. for this particular fight. Uh, Stipe Miocic and Fabrizio Verdun. Wow. Uh, you know, what can you say about that? Fabrizio, <laughs> Fabrizio gets knocked out. Uh, by Stipe, and Stipe is going backwards with a right hand. Uh, I mean, I'm not surprised. Uh, people, people might be surprised that he was able to generate power uh, to knock somebody out going backwards. But if you think about some of the traditional martial arts back in the day, Bruce Lee himself demonstrated the one-inch punch and how much power you can get off of a one-inch punch. And, you know, I think that was probably you know, the characteristics and the fundamentals of the one-inch punch that, that Stipe hit him with. I mean, although he was going backwards, the, there was a short, straight-line punch, and you had Fabrizio running forward, and Stipe was going backwards, right and then he throws that short right hand, and Verdun runs right into it, and that was the end of the night. Uh, I mean, I don't know if it was so much the power of the punch or the lack of a chin, I don't know, however you want to look at it, but all the forces aligned and allowed that to end the fight, and uh, it was cool. I mean, uh, Stipe was surprised, and, uh, you know, like a lot of other people, and I'm sure the whole 42,000 fans that were there were surprised that their uh, Brazilian heavyweight champion got knocked out, but, you know, it is what it is. It's how the fight game goes. He was excited. Uh, oh, yeah, he was definitely excited. <laughs> excited, surprised, uh, overwhelmed. I'm sure he's on the plane right now flying back home. It's like, I can't believe I got the belt. <laughs> I'm just glad he didn't run into that crowd, <laughs> right? Right? <laughs> He'd ran in the crowd. He probably would have got more than a belt. <laughs> the way they was trying, yeah. trying to beat up Matt Brown when he was on his way to the, to the octagon. Uh, let's see. What else we got on the... Uh, on the agenda. Let's talk about this this rumored sale of the UFC. Okay. Um, I mean, I think, obviously there's gotta be some truth to it. Uh, not at less, minimum, they're shopping it. At minimum, they're shopping the idea. Mm -hmm. uh, Cause, you know, for the right price, anything's for sale. Exactly, they've been working at this thing for yeah. how long now, 10 years plus? Yeah, yeah, it's been uh, growing steadily. Yeah, it's been growing steadily. They're getting all of these deals, although some of the deals I don't like. But you know, they're definitely putting the UFC up there. It's uh, to be. I mean, I guess it's still considered the fastest growing sport in the world. But uh, you know, I mean, it's out there. They're just kind of shopping around to see what kind of numbers mm -hmm. that they, that you know people will throw out to them. Uh, I'm sure they've been doing this for years. It's just now that it's so popular that it's being made public. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I mean, I heard it's been upwards to $4 million as a potential offer for the for the UFC. Billion. Yeah, $4 billion. So, Not a bad return. When How much did they pay for it back in the day? About a mil? Uh, yeah, I think they got it for a million, $2 million, something like that. Uh, back in the day when they took it over. Hey... Four billion. I mean, I think Dana's easy, uh, eight percent. <laughs> yeah, Dana's an eight percent shareholder, so he'd get, you know, three hundred forty, fifty million, something like that, something crazy. And then the Fertitas are eighty percent owners, so 
you know, you do the math, yeah. you know. If, I mean, if they want to get out of this business and not have the headache of this business. But at the same time, the UFC wouldn't be able to sell that business and completely eliminate all the players in the business. Uh, Dana White would ha definitely have to stay on mm -hmm. as some type of a consultant or, or run the promotion. Scott Coker... Uh position yeah yeah he would definitely have to be there to uh to Transition show yeah to show the new owners how the business works and to make sure that if they're going to succeed with that business but then again Dana might be that you bought it you deal with it <laughs> going on vacation <laughs> you know <laughs> so but yeah, I sometimes I think that you know they they're ultra businessmen and they wouldn't mind selling it and take a little break but then you again you think look at these guys man they're they're uh taking pictures you know they're they're living the lifestyle too you know yeah. they're all juiced to the gills having a good time anyway yeah you know? yeah for sure but you know it would uh i mean i'm sure they're gonna as long as they own it i'm sure they're gonna shop it around and see mm -hmm. see what kind of offers they can get you know who knows if they keep it for another couple of years the offer may be six billion exactly so you know i mean kudos to them for you know looking at the opportunity to uh you know, turn a profit on the business that they purchased. But yeah, I think the the purchase price was like two million dollars yeah. when they when they got it. Um, let's see. Back to the back to the Bellator MMA stuff. Uh, let's talk about the Davis King Mo fight. Uh, you got two quality. It's funny because when you got two quality heavyweights. Nah, they fought at a uh, light heavy okay. two hundred five. Okay. So you got those two quality guys, uh, very good wrestlers. Uh, typically, if you have two great wrestlers, it ends up being a wild striking match. Uh, and this fight would, okay, similar. I mean, it wasn't a wild striking match. It was kind of a, a slower paced uh, striking match. Uh, both guys kind of show, showed their moments of, uh, of flash during the fight. Uh, King Mo landed some, some good counter, some good, uh, counter techniques and uh, some good counter wrestling. Um, Phil Davis did the same, uh, but the fight was pretty boring. I had it. Uh, King Mo went in the first round. Uh, Phil Davis went in the second round, and whoever picked up the third round would be the winner of the fight. And uh, Phil edged out the third round uh, by getting, uh, I believe he got a takedown. Uh, went for uh, Kamora. King Mo escaped it, ended up back on top. But I think um, during the third, Phil had more of the, uh, I think he landed more shots and had the more dominant position during the third round, which allowed him to, allow Phil Davis to uh, actually pull out the fight. But, you know, overall, it was probably, it was kind of one of those lackluster fights. Uh, but, you know, it's for a title shot. And now uh, Phil Davis will be lined up to fight uh, Liam McGarry for the title, which should be an interesting fight. Uh, McGarry's a big, big dude. He's a lot bigger than Phil Davis. And uh, that fight should be, should be pretty interesting uh, whenever they decide to match that up. Uh, now I want to go into uh, the shenanigans that I had <laughs> at Traders Village. <laughs> Here in San Antonio, Texas, yesterday. So me, me and my business partner, we're doing a demo at the uh, the Asian Pacific Islander uh, Festival at Traders Village here in San Antonio, Texas. So I don't know. I guess it's because I, I mean I guess if you're a known fighter, you get the strangest shit coming your way. <laughs> so this guy sees me. He, you know, he's like. Hey. We've just done a demo. Yeah, we're just doing a demo. We're just there to show, you know, pass out some flyers, uh, promote the school or whatnot. And, you know, I had a demo with some of my Muay Thai students. I had my daughter. I had a couple of, uh, of my other students. You know, we did, uh, we did, some, uh, did some, uh, some combination stuff, and then we uh, went, to, went to hit pads. So a guy comes up to me, you know, he's like, we, oh, we didn't even know there was going to be fights that day. Yeah, we didn't know. I had no idea. <laughs> I had no idea there was going to be Muay Thai fights. So I had a guy, you know, come up to me. He's like, you peace proud? I'm like, yeah. He's like, oh, okay, man. I just want to know how much your privates were. I'm like, well, you know, I charge 100 bucks an hour for private. He's like, oh, okay. He's like, well, uh, well can I ask you something else? I'm like, yeah. He's like, well, what was it like to fight GSP? I'm like, 
really you should be asking GSP what it was like to fight me because I was the famous one. I was the one that had been in the UFC already, and I fought GSP before GSP was GSP. So now we find out that there's going to be Muay Thai fights that day. So I'm like, all right, I'll hang out and stick around. They didn't around. tell any of our guys, but okay, we'll watch Yeah, it, right? you know, I mean, you know, there was, uh, I think, UFC gym here in San Antonio. Dominion MMA is another gym. Uh, Crupet's gym. Lozano MMA. Uh, and Lozano. And I want to say there was one other gym. It's like five gyms that they were matching up out of San Antonio. But anyway, we wouldn't call, but, you know, that's beside the point. But so the guy that was asking me these questions, he happened to be uh, one of Crupet's guys in which Crupet is the promoter that was putting on the tie fights. So you would think, you know, if you're a student of the promoter that, you know, you would know to have all your gear. You're familiar with the requirements, right? Yeah, so the guy is standing up there in the ring, and my guys know me so well that, I don't know, it's like they sensed some shit, some weird shit was going to happen. <laughs> so they was like, yeah, we need to get over here by Pete and be recording and, you know, see what comes out of Pete's mouth, what, what's going to happen with Pete. So we're, we're recording, we're looking at this, the, they're getting ready to do this fight, and we're watching, and I'm I'm noticing that they're talking to this dude. I'm like, this, I don't think this dude has a cup. Sure enough, this guy jumps out of the ring. I don't know why he came to me like he know me, like I'm his coach. I don't know. He comes over to me talking about, hey, man, I need a big favor. I'm like, what? Pete, I need a cup. I need a cup. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> and I know all my guys were sitting there like, what's Pete about to say? I look at the dude, I'm like, what makes you think I got a cup? <laughs> well, you just did a demo. Yeah, I did a demo, not a fight. I ain't got no cup, sorry. And the dude was like still standing there like, like I didn't just tell him that I didn't have a cup to give him. And then he's just like, oh, well, you know anybody? No, I don't know nobody that got a cup. We're out here at the flea market. And like, I'm like, you think they got a pro shop around here, homie? Like, I don't even know you like that. I don't know you at all. So how are you just going to have the audacity? But I guess that comes with the territory of, of being a known fighter and a coach in this area. But I'm just like, man, really? 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 Your coach is the guy putting this together. And you don't know how to bring your own shit. I, I I just don't get it. But anyway, yeah, that was, yeah, that was my fun eventful thing for for yesterday. And if you go to my Facebook page, you can find an upload of the actual event. As uh, I believe my Facebook page is Pete Spratt, uh, two at Facebook.com. But if it's not, you can just search my name, Pete Spratt, and don't go to my Muay Thai page, but go to my personal page. And it's right there on my wall, so you can you can watch the video yourself, man. It was freaking hilarious. I couldn't I couldn't believe what, what the hell was going on with that. On video. And I believe they got fights tie fights today out there at Trader Village, but okay. you know, man, I mean it was crazy. It was crazy. But uh shit's unreal that the shit that I go through on a day to day basis in this fight game that I have for years. And a lot of guys that's been in the game for a long time, they, they'll tell you the same thing. But, I mean, for me, as I've gotten older, uh, the filter on my mouth has just got less and less. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's crazy. I think the reason people come up and ask you all this ridiculous nonsense all the time, it's, it, it's, it's just growing pains of the sport, you know? They don't have the establishment of people there to to lean on all the time and you know you're the closest thing they've seen to a, a legit coach in this game and that's all it is i ain't your friend though <laughs> <laughs> if you if you ain't training at my gym don't be coming up to me asking me for no equipment like like i like what am i gonna do if i had a cup well like if i was wearing a cup what do you want me to do just take it off and give it to you like you know what kind of sense does that make but Hey man, I get, I guess, yeah, man. Really I try to be as nice as I can, but some stuff, man, yeah. it's just, it's just totally ridiculous and over the top. <laughs> Ain't nobody got time for that. Ain't nobody got time for that. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't got time for that at all. But uh, yeah, man. I mean, I, I have fun. I think, uh, you know, I think that's that's pretty good topics for today. Yeah. We've had fun today. Uh, 
just kind of, you know, getting our feet wet in this whole podcast thing. And, uh, you know, it'll continue to grow and get better once we figure out everything that we're doing. But, you know, I had a good time in the man cave today. I don't know about you, Brian, but... Absolutely. Let me remind all of our listeners and viewers that if you have any questions or comments, you can send us an email or leave us a comment on Facebook, and we're going to do our best to go through and read those in our next episode. So uh, we really appreciate everyone listening, and we hope to talk to you again soon. Peace out from the man cave.